Massachusetts Representative Ayanna Presley is among the progressive members of the Democratic freshman class who are making headlines by holding the Trump administration accountable. As Slate succinctly put it this week, the freshman Democratic women get so much attention because they do good things that Democrats like. That includes calling out the continued horror undocumented migrants are facing at Border Patrol facilities in Texas. And joining me now is Congresswoman Presley, who visited Border Patrol facilities in Clint and El Paso, Texas on Monday. Um, and thank you so much for being here um, this morning, Congresswoman. Um, a little earlier, we played some of the sound of you outside of one of these facilities as you're describing what happened inside. If you could just tell us a little bit more about what you saw when you went into that facility and how you were treated as a member of Congress. Well, it's easy for me to speak to what I saw because I can't unsee what I've seen and I can't unfeel what I felt in that moment. It was a devastating confirmation how broken the system is. Um, when we entered into the cell, uh, there were all of these women there. And when Representative Ocasio-Cortez uh, began to speak and engage the women in Spanish, they began to speak with great emotion there were many tears, and I don't speak Spanish, but I'm a mom, and I didn't need to understand or speak Spanish to know what they were expressing and what I felt in that space. It was palpable trauma, fear, and they were less concerned about their own well-being and welfare and all very concerned about where their children were. Yeah. And let me play a little bit of a, a this was a piece that uh, one of our, our reporters here at NBC did just talking about the, the Clint facility in Texas. Take a listen. Most of the children who I met with haven't had any opportunity to bathe or shower since crossing the border. One of the things that we hear a lot is just about the stench. Diseases are spreading. There's also a lice infestation. I'll we'll talk about how hungry they are. These are the most appalling conditions I have seen in my 12 years of representing children and families who are detained. Is that, is that what you experienced? Children who were hungry, um, who hadn't showered, um, who didn't have enough food. Um, that's, that's what we're reading in the New York Times. Is that what you saw as well? Well, yes, um, I'll confirm all of that. And I do want to say that uh, there's been a great um, reporting on the human rights abuses and violations uh, for those that are most vulnerable, our children. Um, but I really just want to underscore that this is an anti-family and even, I would argue, an, an un-American uh, policy. It flies in the face of um, the very ideals that we espouse um, in being a place of refuge and a beacon of light. Uh, we have got to usher in a paradigm shift and a system change, uh, no more to the mass deportation, uh, to the criminalizing, uh, the mass detaining of families. This family separation uh, policy is um, inhumane and cruel. I spoke with a medical professional there, and when I expressed my outrage that women there had not showered in 15 days, I asked him, did he think this was a public health uh, issue or human rights violation? And he said, it certainly is unsavory and unpleasant, but it's debatable as to whether or not it is a human rights violation or a public health threat. Wow. I mean, that's what we're up against. Yeah. So the culture is um, calloused, and we have to change it. And, and you know, the. There's a perception, I think, among ordinary people um, that there are all these powerful institutions that are supposed to stop wrongdoing, right? And so earlier in the show, um, I had on an immigration lawyer, um, someone who's worked with the FBI, a former member of CPB. They each agreed that there is no, there's not even a necessarily a legal accountability for what's being done to these families. So there's that. Then you have Congress, which has enormous power as well. You were one of four people who voted against a bill that just passed through to fund, to give more money to CBP and these agencies, but without any demands or protections for the kids in it. Can you explain why it is that, that you guys are getting kind of shade, those of you who didn't vote for the bill, um, really more on not voting with your caucus? And what protections are there if Congress can't demand that the administration take just human care of these, of these um, families? Sure. Well, I'll just say that this, um, this is an issue of consequence to uh, our country, but certainly to the district I represent, the Massachusetts 7th. And I am committed to uh, justice, uh, to the preservation of families, 
uh, from the border all the way to Blue Hill Avenue. And my district is 40% immigrant. And the, the fear is real and only growing. And the abuses of ICE have been felt in my district, the Massachusetts 7th. Uh, I do believe Dr. Maya Angelou said it best, when people show you who they are, believe them. And ICE and CBP, these agencies in this culture, have proven themselves to be rogue and racist and to abuse power over and over again. CBP is the largest law enforcement agency with the least amount of transparency and accountability. And that's why I've been pushing and advocating for an oversight hearing. I do serve on the Oversight and Reform Committee under the leadership of Chairman Elijah Cummings uh, to bring CBP uh, before this committee uh, so that we can uh, talk about the what has happened relative to the family separation policy, this corrupt, callous, and chaotic culture that is CBP, and hold uh, these agencies accountable. And given the recent uh, story on the Facebook group, uh, it only emboldens me uh, in this advocacy and the need for oversight. It is frightening to think that people that hold this view of these families are charged with overseeing their welfare and their well-being. Yeah. The women in that cell that were detained shared with us, one of them uh, speaks four languages, including English, and that uh, the CBP uh, were unaware of this, and that uh, they use uh, very derogatory, demoralizing language in talking to the women and about them, sexist uh, and racist language. Uh, and it's just a very... It's just demoralizing. It was a, a devastating experience, but it was necessary. The policy is, um, is the system is broken. Um, what we need is a system that supports a legal right to asylum at a port of entry, that allows folks to settle into community while awaiting a review of their case. The system is just broken from A to Z, and this was devastating confirmation of that. And I've been haunted since this visit. The women were worried that after they told us their truth, uh, that they would experience retaliation. And every day I've been thinking about what might be happening to them. Wow. Um, and, and, and while that is happening, uh, it's sort of a corollary policy from this administration is to try to change the census um, to also disadvantage communities with immigrants in it. So there's this sort of two pronged hit on people who are migrants to this country. I want to let you listen to Ken Cusinelli, who is the acting director of the United States Citizenship and Immigration Service. Uh, this is him this morning. To know for both voter allocation and because of the requirements of the Voting Rights Act and frankly, as part of the ongoing debate about how we deal both financially and legally with the burden of those who are not here legally. Um, that is, that is a, a relevant issue. And of course, for my agency, United, USCIS, we deal with legal immigration in addition to things like asylum and knowing where to put our resources um, it makes us more efficient as well. That, that is Ken Cusinelli on Friday. That sounds like uh, the administration would also like to use a census question to try to further defund um, anything to do with, with migrants to this country, because that seems to be why they want the question in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, I serve on the Oversight and Reform Committee, and um, Secretary Ross uh, did come before our committee. It would be generous to say that he testified. Um, he did what every uh, cabinet member of this administration has done any time they come before us, and that is to evade, to stonewall, and to obstruct. Um, it is just, um, <laughs> I'm shaking my head because when they are talking about families and the contributions that immigrants are making to this country every day, uh, to our community, to our culture, um, to our economy, um, they are certainly not, not a burden. Uh, they are uh, community members. And this is just a, one more example of uh, the xenophobia and the racist policies that come out of this administration every single day. Uh, this will uh, further uh, impact uh, the funding, uh, the allocation of funding to communities that are already marginalized, under-resourced, and underfunded, um, because it will contribute uh, to the fear, the xenophobia, and people's um, just, just the general fear. It's yeah. just palpable. It's just everywhere. And, and as I said, it's an issue of consequence to my district in that it is 40% uh, immigrant. And so 
Uh, we have seen up close and personal the abuses of these agencies, which are criminalizing families. Yeah, I, I am out of time, but I just have to ask you before we go because I think this is a big question for our audience. You're, you know, you're a freshman to Congress. You're just, you know, getting into this into this job. Do you think that there's going to be accountability for anyone for what's been done to these kids? We're certainly going to demand it and to work for it. I know I am. Um, you know, <laughs> there has to be. I, I just, this has been uh, devastating and heartbreaking, and I am just sick and tired of the full freedoms, the health and safety of black and brown children and families being compromised and moderated. Yeah. And I will keep fighting. I will absolutely keep fighting.